All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Munch and Learn. As you can see, we are virtual again today. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Sloan. I am the Public Programs Coordinator at the Dixon. We'll go over a few reminders and pieces of housekeeping keeping information before we start. Uh, we are recording this session as usual, and you can find each week's talk published on the Dixon's YouTube channel. So if you ever wanna revisit a talk or make a recommendation to a friend, you can find them there. If you have any questions for our speaker, please drop them in the chat and I'll read them to him at the end and we'll get the question answered for you. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Donald Pell. For 27 years, Donald Pell has worked professionally in horticulture as a garden designer. His work draws inspiration from the forms and plant communities he has seen in nature, in design landscapes, and in the work of the countless professionals he has studied and consulted. This talk will explore some of what he has learned and how it is translated to a few of his projects, as well as what he has learned from both his successes and some failures in gardening. Donald, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for everyone who's attending <clears throat> and um, thanks to the folks at Dixon. I had a great honor of being asked to come down to Memphis to work on a garden, um, which I'm really excited about. And we also have a, uh, another project in Asheville. So, uh, I'm getting to tour the South a little bit. I'm really excited about that and um, look at new plant um, compositions. And I thought what I'd like to share is just some of the work we're doing at our own studio, which is, um, you know, uh, an exercise in developing novel plant communities and looking at um, just analyzing that work and seeing, you know, what we're doing well and what we're doing maybe not so well. And um, uh, people generally don't love to talk about the failures, but I think they're interesting and we thought we'd uh, share some of those as well. So, um, let's see. <clears throat> All right. So this is, uh, this is kind of the oval in our garden. And, you know, one of the things I love to do, having the opportunity to work in this garden, um, is we get outside often and really look at what's happening. We're always trying to compose new plantings. Uh, we certainly, um, <laughs> we, um, we're certainly use it as an opportunity to teach um, our own staff in that, in that uh, garden. Sorry, I just had a cat come visit me. Um, and you know, here we're looking at different panicum cultivars and how much variability there might be in them. Um, in seed strains and panicum. Um, this is the original office before there were really any plants there except this big gangly uh, uh, pyracanthum uh, hiding this uh, horrible facade. And, and when I bought this farm, really we had very limited resources. And so we really looked at highly competitive plants so we could start doing what we do as gardeners, you know, and that's build a garden. And so that's exactly what we did. We wanted the entry to be very clean and simple. And so we selected cool season grasses. This is Cecilaria autumnalis on the right <clears throat> and Pycnanthum amuticum kind of in the center, which from a four inch plug can become a four foot diameter um, stand in, in no time. Um, and then things like Agastache um, blue fortune, which um, in the mid Atlantic, can be in flower in about two months and flower for the entire summer. Um, and then as a privacy barrier, we looked at big, big plants, uh, Miscanthus giganteus, which is a sterile seed strain. So we don't have to worry about that plant kind of becoming noxious, um, but really great as a screen. Um, and then plants like uh, Peroskia, this is the cultivar filigrin. Um, and so we really were just looking at how, how do we manage space? And that, that's just with highly competitive plants that are very quickly established. Um, and even white willow, which was a really fun plant we got to work with, Salix alba, Britanzensis. Uh, again, not having a lot of resources after I spent my life savings acquiring this um, farm for the company. Um, we took some live stakes and just jammed them in the ground and they started developing in the shrubs. Um, and, and here you can see even the autumn color starting to develop in the miscanthus. So really effective plant. Um, last season, we didn't even cut this to the ground, just let the new columns kind of emerge back to the old dead um, stems. And, um, you know, not a plant we use 
on a lot of sites. It's a big plant, but even in the winter, this stands up very upright and um, is really effective at hiding our, our uh, office parking. And that's what we were looking for, you know, doing more with less. Um, here you can see the miscanthus start to push into the garden, the rhizomes uh, without much management over 10 years. Um, the, um, that stand that was, that is over to the left, you can see starting to creep into the middle of the screen here. So there is a level of management with plants like this. Um, it doesn't need to be done annually necessarily, but um, you know, kind of the perfect and perfect for us. Um, that was four quart pots when I planted it. Um, and it didn't take long to develop a big screen. And, you know, I'm always, I, I'm in love with our autumn and winter landscape. I love these seed heads of the mountain mint popping through. Um, and when there's frost on them, uh, and I'm always looking for plants that just have great structure autumn and winter. However, uh, <laughs> this is a parasitic weed called dotter. And if you're not familiar with it, um, you're lucky. And we don't see this often in the landscape here in the Mid-Atlantic, but we kind of hit the lottery and it jumped into those gardens and we had to eradicate the entire front planting until the daughter, which was um, you know, using our perennials as host plants had lost vigor and had disappeared. Um, but that just gave us an opportunity to replant. And so what was this really aggressive spreading uh, kind of a uh, long stolen of pignanthemum became Allium millennium and uh, Panicum virgatum shenandoah, which is also a sterile um, seed uh, selection. So we don't see this Panicum ever seed out in the mid-Atlantic. Um, however, I believe when I was down in Memphis, Dale mentioned to me that um, I think they get a lot of rust on this Panicum. So maybe not as effective for you, but um, nonetheless, what we are looking for is what plants are really uh, effective and clean and easy to work with. Um, there's the panicum coloring up and the alliums after it's in bloom. Um, and again, I'm always looking at that winter landscape. That's the panicum kind of coloring up in the summer. And I just love that plant. Although we are noticing rust on this plant now, um, however, some of the breeders think it's from tissue culture and not necessarily from um, vegetative propagation because you can't really grow this panicum from seed. It's all vegetatively propagated. Um, and then, you know, we would play with plants, new bulb layers all of the time, trying to get, develop cool season layers. Um, this is uh, Fritillaria persica, which is a really beautiful plant. Um, however, what we also noticed was um, when the flowers are done and this plant starts going dormant, um, the, uh, the knees of it get really kind of elongated and ugly. And, uh, you know, another lesson that this needs to be kind of emerging through a short gra grass layer or as it starts to go dormant, it really does look tattered in the landscape. And we, uh, we did not do that in this instance. So, um, again, it's not only the plant, but it's how you compose that plant. Um, that is really important, I think. So those plants look great together and the uh, plant community looks great together. Uh, the front of the office was just kind of consumed with some ugly plants. And again, we wanted to expend, extend that garden through. And so again, we just looked at really competitive plants that wouldn't cost us a lot of money to, um, to work with. Uh, Sprobulus or uh, Spodiopogon sibiricus is this grass you see in the foreground. and Here's our cat, um, I can show it. And Rebecca grandiflora, which does tend to seed around. Um, so um, really looking at just plants that would effectively move. Uh, the Tricertus here on the left, uh, toad lily is a beautiful um, late autumn blooming perennial. However, you can see if we plant it in a block here, it takes a while for that to start to wake up in the spring. And we do tend to get a little cool season weed pressure in between those plants. And so what we found that is we spray them out a little bit further um, and add some cool season layers like sedges or bulb layers, maybe as muscari. It helps to really stabilize the ground plane in the spring. So um, folks are not feeling the pressure to add mulch all the time, which we see as a, generally a detriment to these plantings. 
the gravel starts coming in the following year and you can start to see uh, the, the flowers of acanthus on the right, um, the spring layers of baptisias. And here we're mixing baptisia Carolina moonlight with baptisia australis. I, I mix baptisias often. Um, we're doing a garden in Asheville right now where I'm doing uh, baptisia glucantha with uh, baptisia purple smoke. And I love that combination um, as well. Um, and here we have rattlesnake master, Ringium yuccasifolia, which can be highly um, competitive. We have this plant in a shaley site up in the mountains. And this plant, it just wants to seed into everything in that sharply drained soil. Um, so what we've been forced to do in that application is go ahead and cut the seed heads off before they develop and start to um, kind of consume much of the garden. In these heavier clays, we don't see them be as um, aggressive, especially with the, um, in a planting composition amongst this Bodiopogon, this tall grass here you see, um, it just, they work really nicely as a composition together. Um, and, and that's really important as well. You know, we find that if we put overly competitive plants with plants that might be a little more docile in terms of how they uh, uh, replicate themselves or, um, keep themselves uh, stable in the landscape, uh, we can have plants out compete one another. So it's really important for us to understand plants and how, how they're gonna grow together. Um, Persicarium plexitale, this is fire tail. And this is one of the few plants that'll bloom um, our entire summer in very low light. Um, I love this plant and we planted it with this Aster Tartaricus jindai from the jindai gardens in Kyoto. Um, Again, both of these plants are very aggressive and very stable. Although we're noticing um, this year for the first time, the aster is actually starting to push the person carry out a little bit. And that's because we haven't intervened at all. You know, um, we'll never see weeds in between these plants, but um, one is starting to push out the other. So, um, you know, often we'll have people ask us, oh, I want a low maintenance garden. And there's just, you know, after 27 years in business and being a gardener since I was very young, I grew up in my mother's nursery. I've never found a, you know, a no maintenance garden for sure. Uh, um, you could certainly have something that just becomes very wild, but you'll be left with a lot of monocultures often. Um, and, and this certainly does take some management, but we're just trying to reduce that as much as possible. And so if I had to go in every few years and pull out some of the rhizomes of this, this aster here, and that's still very successful to me. And here's the autumn colors of that persicaria, kind of going dormant, but it has a really nice kind of um, uh, reddish hue to it. And this is Cornus acusa satomi. And my favorite grasses are these millennias, which just started coloring up in our garden now. That's this tall, uh, tall inflorescence here. This is millennia cordo and breathtaking autumn colors out of this plant. As we move through the garden, here's a canthus. Um, I don't know if you're able to actually grow this down south. Um, uh, this is from the Mediterranean. This is a canthus hungaricus. And I actually found this plant growing in Pompeii in the ancient village of Pompeii, which is really cool. Um, and the Greeks used to use the, the foliage to adorn their columns in, in Greece. Um, but again, this plant can become four foot by four foot once it's mature. And what we have found, if we go through a dry spell, it starts, the foliage starts to get tattered. So if you put this in the front of a border, it can look really bad if you have a drought stricken year. Um, and so we're really, when we use this plant, it's kind of set back in a border where there'll be other layers that tend to stay very clean. I love the flower of this plant. I love the scale of it. But if you have a really awful year and we don't irrigate our garden, um, this, this can look really bad in the front of a garden. So again, it's, it's very much about how we're gonna compose these plants together. So even in the worst years, we're gonna to try to uh, hedge our bets in terms of making these plantings still look really strong. Uh, moving through the garden, we have these plantings of Persicaria and Silphium. This large leaf plant is a Midwest native called Silphium terebinthanaceum, where um, in, garden soils, we can have the flowers up at eight feet tall. 
Um, we have these annuals here with the purple flowers of uh, Verbena bondariensis, which tend to seed around the garden as well. And we can kind of edit those out. Uh, and two different types of Russian sage. This is Perovskia little spires and Perovskia filigrin. And I kind of put those together so our own staff could kind of see the difference and how they grow. Most people would walk by and never really even notice that those plants are different. Um, but uh, to me, they certainly look different. One's definitely more upright and a heavier flower set and the other is kind of thinner and more open. Um, this is the banding that we initially installed coming out of that front walkway. And it looks a little sterile to me. However, I, you know, I really love this look. Although we put the verbena in and it just starts to seed in between those pathways. And we just edited it out where we want. But um, I really like this. It's kind of playful. We'll, we'll add a ringium, uh, roast a couple in those cracks sometimes or some thyme. And, um, you know, I, I love doing this. I love compressing people through plantings. Um, however, this sophium here, what we are finding, again, very highly competitive, um, high amount of viable seed in our soils. And so as much as I love the architectural foliage of that plant, um, it really starts to put pressure on the rest of the garden. So we do go in and now we cut the stems off before all that seed starts to uh, disperse through the garden. Um, I'm not ready to get rid of that plant. I think it's beautiful. But, um, you know, given some of the existing plant compositions we have here, it's just um, really puts a lot of pressure on. So, you know, we're, it's just something we manage and we're always working with our maintenance crews and we do manage gardens we build locally um, to understand how we can have these plants and manage them. Um, and sometimes we have to remove some of these. And that's been a big learning curve for us as well to get gardeners to think of plants as weeds at times and not every plant is necessarily something we want they can become overly competitive uh, this was a planting we did out by our roadside where we had kind of a drainage ditches across the road that had a lot of weed seed in them and we were getting pressure so coreopsis zagreb was selected because of how quickly it um, kind of moves through the landscape however i hated these colors together i thought they were so gross we did this you know, Zagreb is kind of a gold with the blue prost. Yeah, it was really just kind of garish to me. Although the lesson really was, if you just wait, you know, um, at least this planting, I love the autumn color of this. As it was going dormant, it just turned black. And, you know, it was actually a, kind of a longer season of interest to me with these black seed heads when the uh, frost would set on them. And then these autumn colors of the Spodia pogon and the millennia, this is millennia, uh, Carl Forrester, actually. Um, I think you all can grow some uh, Calamagrasis Carl Forrester down there, which is um, we also have in our garden, but uh, he also named the millennia after him. He, he must have liked himself a lot, um, but uh, I think he could have named what after his mother or something. But, uh, and even the Coreopsis coming through the uh, uh, Prosky here, these silver stems of this substrub, I thought was really beautiful. Um, and so again, you know, we're just kind of, uh, we're kind of have stumbled through this sometimes and um, have, have seen things that we weren't expecting. And this is one of those examples, you know, we were just really looking for competitive plants that would kind of outcompete the weed seed pressure. And we got to have this really nice winter composition. Uh, moving through the landscape here, um, you can see the millennials that are really coloring up um, down on the right. Uh, you can see uh, the, the props is, and this was another lesson we learned the hard way. I really love these blocks of, of plant material. Prosky is very warm season here in the mid-Atlantic, and so it doesn't wake up forever, and it allows a lot of light to penetrate through the canopy of these shrubs, uh, and what we found was if we just planted them in blocks, we were getting a lot of weed pressure between these shrubs, um, conventionally, what we had seen when we went back to some of our gardens uh, that were maybe out of town and clients were managing them, they would put bark mulch or something like that around these plants to try to suppress um, the cool season weeds. And then they would end up rotting this shrub out because it really wants well-drained soil and it doesn't want any kind of woody mulch around it. Um, and you can see the cutback I just did recently 
Um, you can see all that weed pressure in there, the chickweed. Uh, we're going to thin out, actually, I think tomorrow, we're going to thin out some of these shrub layers and um, put muscari through all of them. So a very cool season bulb layer that tends to persist pretty long into the season. Um, and we'll also add some sedges, Carex abernia and Carex bunny blue um, as an underplanting. Because as much as I like, you know, this block planting, it's just um, truly not effective. And I think you can have both, right? You can pull that planting out, but you just need space in between the plants. Um, so we have a cool season layer to really suppress some of these um, um, spring layer, cool season weeds. Moving around our landscape, we have, uh, you know, this really nice patio we put in that's really simple. Um, and I, I really wanted to kind of, the, the house is pretty not beautiful, we'll say. Um, and so we use plants like Roos and Stewardias, things that would be columnar. And um, on the outskirts, we use some really big Amsonias. This is Amsonia Tabernay Montana Illustrious that can grow to about 48 inches here. And um, thought the blue might compose nice with the Shephorbia Palustris, uh, the bracts on the Shephorbia. And I think that's really beautiful. Um, here's some uh, Baptisia Purple Smoke kind of intermixed in that uh, composition. And that was kind of a delightful kind of mix of plant colors that I just played around with. And I was really happy with how that came out. And even some lower millennias, this is Millennia Hildebrandt, uh, which is, you know, maybe grows to about 36 inches here, very fine foliage, uh, mixed with this Sestrantia Roma. And um, I found that to be very effective. Again, the, the forb of the Estrantia really weaved in and seeded around the millennias. And it was really effective at um, suppressing weed seed pressure. And also, I just I love these Estrantias here in the Mid-Atlantic. They work really well. And I, I thought that was beautiful. And even mixing in with uh, um, some geranium, uh, two different types of geranium here. Um, there's a macarizum, and that's um, uh, dillies. Um, um, and, uh, and with the Estrantia, I thought that was very nice. And of course, through that millennia, I also added a later layer of uh, stackies. This is humulo, which you know will bloom kind of early summer. However, the foliage on this plant is also very cool season. And so it's very early to wake up and have basal foliage down on the ground plane. And it's very late to go dormant. And I've actually even noticed this in the mid-Atlantic as almost evergreen and definitely semi-evergreen. So it's, it's very effective at covering the ground plane for us. It's a very clean flower. We're growing a Fishinalis, which is a little taller and more upright, and Summer Crush, which is more of a peachy pink color as well. And I've just mixed this Summer Crush with this purple humlo together. And I think that's a really nice composition as well. Uh, maybe about um, 30 to 40% Summer Crush. And, and that was really nice. Maybe I'll have a picture of that in the future. Um, some clematis we're growing. This is Praycox, which is a really nice um, light pink, uh, purple rather, a small flower about an inch wide. And I'm using clematis more and more as ground covers and not really thinking about them training them up on arbors where they tend to look kind of patterned to me on the interior of their arbor or up a wall. Um, I'm really, I love this plant as a ground cover. It's really effective. We generally don't see a lot of weeds push through these plants. Um, right next to it is Santa Marilandica, um, a great uh, native. This is native to the Eastern seaboard and really beautiful all winter long. It has these black seed heads. Um, however, we've also found um, even in a kind of an established grassland, this plant starts to be really thuggish and put a lot of pressure on an established uh, kind of spontaneous landscape. And certainly in a garden setting, um, this plant was just too competitive. And so just this year we've eradicated completely from the garden. We're just pulling seedlings out all of the time. And you can see how big it is here. Um, the bees love this plant, but um, really difficult to manage a plant like this in the landscape. Um, here's how we had bindweed in this section of the garden. And for those of you who have worked with bindweed, it really gets into the clumps of plants, 
in between rhizomes. And once it's in there, it's just, uh, you're always pulling that plant. And so what we had decided to go, do, and management's really important for us to get right the first time, because if you're not doing it, uh, it just becomes very expensive for people to maintain gardens. Um, we just went in and cleared up the entire perennial layer and then spot treated with glyphosate until we knew that that plant was 100% eradicated. Uh, it it's, doesn't look great in our garden to leave this planting for an entire season, but it's the only way we can be you know, certain that we've eradicated such a noxious weed. Um, that's definitely been a problem weed for us. Uh, quack grass and razor grass are other real problem weeds for us in the landscape here. Uh, and so again, uh, in terms of how we treat space, it's really kind of thinking about not only weeding, but kind of sterilizing some of these more noxious weeds and making sure they're eradicated before then we go in. And you could seed in a cover crop, uh, you know, something like Camacris or um, something like that, that you don't mind knocking down later with the, with the herbicide, or if you don't want to use a herbicide over digging, but I think it's really important that you just go in and effectively manage that space, the winter landscape in that space, which I thought was quite nice with the Cecilarias and the uh, Millennia. And another thing we love to do is just bring the landscape into um, the home. And here we have Stewardias where we have Cardinals coming in. And that takes just a little bit of management to make sure those layers are not getting so thick that um, the owners can't peer through the windows, right? So a little bit of pruning. Uh, uh, meadow rue is a favorite plant of mine. These can be seven foot tall, um, have these beautiful purpley stems with these nice pink flowers, but they will seed around here in these heavier clays. And so it's been really important for us to get people to understand that every plant is just not desirable. If some of those are seeding around and covering your windows, <laughs> it's okay to come and weed some of that material out of the garden. And even our own gardeners, you know, they see these plants and they're so beautiful, but we don't want to block the windows. We just want to get that foliage in the windows a little bit. And this is perfect in that uh, this uh, Thelectrum rotubrianum has this perfectly scaffolded foliage so it doesn't get too dense and it really allows a lot of that light to come through. Uh, Aronias are another favorite. It's like clockwork in February where the Eastern Bluebird just loves to come in. These berries get perfectly fermented and they'll come in and just devour these, um, these berries on chokeberry. And I just love this. I, I get excited and wait for this to happen every year. Um, moving through the back of the garden, you know, we experiment again with a lot of different plants. Salvias are uh, not the longest lived plant here for us in the Mid-Atlantic, but can be very showy for several years. Um, I got to tour uh, the Lori Garden out in Chicago and there are rivers of um, salvia that were used by uh, Pete Aldoff in, out in that garden. Um, and in spending time with the director, they really pointed us in the direction of Wasui, which is a very clean, compact form of salvia numerosa and just will bloom through the middle for you know, the entire season. This year, it got a little tattered and we did not cut it back. And you know, in hindsight, it probably would have been nice to cut it back. We just got so hot and dry here. But um, Wasabi for sure has been an extremely effective selection. And then looking through the gardens, you know, we're, this is kind of a drain swale. And so we use plants like Carex muscingamensis, palm sedge, which I thought was really beautiful. And here we're mixing a couple types of uh, Eupatorium as a trial. On the right is Eupatorium dubium, the straight species, and the left is Eupatorium um, um, phantom, which is a, a patented selection. Um, some more Perovskias. This is Lacy Blue, which is a really compact version. And again, we're planting those through different sedge layers now as a cool season layer that will suppress those early weeds. And in the middle here, we have Gutalua gracilis blonde ambition which I think is the most beautiful grass, although we're finding it's just not reliable. It's really kind of a specialist grass. And there are a lot of soils, although all the literature says dry, uh, well-drained soil, we planted it in those <laughs> cultural conditions and it's failed for us at times. Uh, this planting is very effective. Although again, we made the mistake 
of just doing a big block of it. And it's so late to wake up. Um, we will have weed seed pressure um, between it. And so really important if you're gonna plant something like this, that you leave some space and you plant another layer through the Budalua or Prosky or whatever you're planting. Here it is with uh, prairie drop seeds, Brabos heterolepsis. And on the right, Allium millennium, which again is kind of a, is like cheating in the garden. It's just so, so perfect all the time, clean plant. And uh, the view down into our oval, we have uh, wild petunia, Ruellia, uh, humulus here on the right, and petrinia, or I'm sorry, um, um, uh, self heal uh, kind of in the middle, which we started propagating from our field. It kind of looks like a weed and you put it in a garden. It has a, uh, you're seeing the buds here in the middle, but um, really beautiful flower all summer long. Um, Prunella vulgaris, I'm sorry, it escaped me for a second there. Um, but a really nice clean plant that's not really widely used in the trade yet. Uh, there's a new selection out from Brent Hoverth out of Intrinsic called Magdalena. And we're working a lot with that, used it at our exhibit at the Philadelphia Flower Show. And that is a really showy um, cultivar or selection of Prunella vulgaris that we're excited about. Uh, again, and, uh, this is Salvi East Friesland with Amsonia Tabernae Montana uh, Blue Weiss, which is the dwarf version. And I'm really loving those colors together. And upper right here, you can see the Baptisia Minor purple smoke. And I think, you know, all these saturated purples, uh, just a little bit of different hue to the purples, I think are really nice. And then looking into the garden, and I mentioned that big foliage, Sylphium ter uh, terebinthinaceum, and here it is. It had kind of escaped its planting, and it seeded into the back garden. So as much as I love this foliage and I love the flower, um, I love the architectural form. It is a plant that we're allowing in our garden, but um, you know you do need to manage some of these plants, and this is certainly one that you have to manage. Um, here in the middle. There's Flomus cashmerianae. That's another plant that's really kind of um, clumping up quickly for us. It has world foliage, which I really like, um, but it will start to put a lot of pressure on the surrounding plantings. Uh, not every year, but it, it's very competitive and I do love this plant, but it has to be managed a bit. Um, looking through, this is another Carex we started playing with. Um, kind of off the radar, Carex alata, which is kind of a, a very upright and vasey form. Its inflorescence actually turns black late in the spring. And I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, it'll grow in marginal light. It likes low, uh, higher, you know, full exposure with some moisture. Um, but I, I really am enjoying this plant. Um, just really clean plant throughout the growing season. And then composing other colors together, again, the Eupatorium dubium and uh, Minarda, Brad Ber or, um, Minarda fistulosa. And it's my understanding down around the Memphis area, the Minardas do really poorly. You just get a lot of powdery mildew, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that's kind of a, a no-go, but um, just as an example of composing plants together, I love these colors together. However, this Minarda fistulosa, the straight species, just wants to seed everywhere in the garden. Um, and so we've had to abandon this plant because it's just, it's uh, too competitive. Uh, I started mixing this Ubatorium with the Sanguisorba officinalis, which has a really nice small red flower. And I think this mauve pink with the red looks really great. I um, actually just installed a garden uh, about an hour from here yesterday. And uh, I mixed those two plants together. Uh, I hope I'm not repeating myself too much, but, um, you know, really nice color composition. And I do like this, but just too competitive. Um, I wanted to put some alliums in our oval. This is Purple Sensation. Um, and really showy, beautiful spring bulb. Um, <laughs> here's my, my favorite 10-year-old posing next to this plant. Um, but you can see how kind of ugly that plant gets the foliage as it starts to break down. Uh, and that's really not what we're looking for. We had some spra um, some uh, little blue stem in with that planting. And I took this photograph out on the coast in the Pinelands of New Jersey, 
one morning, it must've been seven o'clock in the morning uh, or earlier and the fog was just coming up. And I thought it was really interesting and beautiful. And it wasn't until I looked at my photos later, one of the things I really loved about it was the spent foliage from the season previous. And this was Andrew Pogon Girardii and probably Schizocarum scoparium growing together. Um, and I thought that kind of tawny foliage from the year before was really beautiful in amongst these clumps of panicum and irigrostis that was coming up. And so, you know, the following year, we just kind of played with that a little bit. And this is, you know, uh, probably end of May, June in our garden. And it's not perfect, but it's it definitely, the previous year's foliage is definitely hiding um, how kind of undesirable the, the foliage of the alliums get. and again it's kind of blocky and heavy-handed it's not perfect yet but um i i really am enjoying the um you know last year's foliage coming up through some of the green new foliage of the spring and in the background here you can see calamagrasis carl forrester and again this might be early june end of may and yet the calamagrasis even still looks really good and so I'm really playing with that more and more. We've left a lot of Panicum Shenandoah up in the garden. And I love how the alliums come through it. I think it's a really, really fun thing to play with in the garden. Uh, this is the spring version of that space. And you can see here down in the center right, um, the little blue stem starting to come in. And the calamagrasis, this might be end of June, uh, June July, the calamagrasis is already putting on a great show. Um, and I'm really loving that. And the little blue stem, this is it in the autumn. Uh, little blue stem starting to color up. This is standing ovation, by the way. Most of the little blue stem here um, starts to flop in our heavy clay. Um, but this one does really well in heavier clays and doesn't flop at all the entire season. Um, a fun, you know, again, kind of a, an accident where I mix Verona Castrum lavender towers with some Agastasi. And the lavender towers, it got dry and it went dormant. And I, you know, maybe some folks would have cut this back. Um, but I just thought the, the kind of spent foliage was so beautiful and interesting looking coming through the Agastasi. And we probably got three months of it looking like this with just this dormant foliage coming through this blue Agastasi. And um, again, um, sometimes the gardeners want to get in there and intervene. And uh, I model a lot of my early wolf uh, my early work after uh, the German design of Wolfgang Irma. And he used to say that the greatest threat to most gardens are the gardener. And I think often he was right. You know, we, we just want to get in there and fix it all the time instead of just calming down and breathing and, and looking. And sometimes these plantings can look really great. Um, I think I have a picture of some Astobe purple candles here, here which a client was committed Miserating with me about how ugly that flower looks when it's kind of finished blooming. And I shared with her that I thought she was right. However, if you just wait another month or so, um, the seed heads look very much like this Veronica Astrum. They kind of turn this nice cocoa color. And here in the Mid Atlantic, it looks really beautiful all winter long. So, again, uh, if we can kind of step outside our comfort zone sometimes and just look instead of feeling that we need to intervene all the time. Sometimes some really special things can happen in the garden. Here it is again with some calamagrasis as a backdrop. And I don't know, maybe a lot of people think this is just ugly. I think this is so beautiful. Um, and here's some, um, something else I played with. This is Jubitorium um, hisopifolium, um, uh, which is a coastal plain uh, Joe pie weed. And that white was just so billowy in amongst this calamagrasis. I thought that was really beautiful. We played with a couple different Rebecca's. This was Rebecca Fulgita demii, which is a much smaller flower and foliage. We didn't see any powdery mildew on this plant for years yet here. Um, and it blooms much later, but much longer than some of the other selections like Goldstrom, which we've seen a lot of problems with powdery mildew, kind of a very short flower on that plant. Uh, also off to the left here, uh, and in the center of this frame is Rebecca uh, grandiflora, which we're a little bit north of this plant, but um, it's really doing pretty pretty well for us here. And I think it's just the most beautiful 
um, plant. Um, really nice Corolla, beautiful seed head when it goes dormant. Um, this was the Corolla started coloring up and got some red on it. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I'm excited about this plant. It's maybe the third year we've had it in our garden. And this is where I found the color composition in my home. I was just putting Helianthus uh, uh, microcephalus and Rebecca together. And I love those gold and kind of um, orange yellows together. I thought that was really nice. And so we just played with that, you know, mixing some Rebecca's. Um, I thought that was a really fun kind of thing to do in the garden. Um, in the back of this garden was a, a, an interesting plant from the Midwest I found out in prairies. That's Arnoglossum or Tripifolium. They've changed it to Cacalea or Tripifolium now. Um, really beautiful umbel on this plant. It grows to about seven feet tall. Um, I saw it at the Schulenberg Prairie out at the Morton Arboretum. I was traveling with uh, Alex Betts, who's the grandson of uh, uh, Kurt Blumel, who's kind of a renowned, um, was a renowned nurseryman. Um, Kurt had passed on and Alex runs the nursery now. Um, and he had some seedlings his grandfather had. So he sent them out to us. Um, and here's Arno Glossom as it's finishing. And here it is as it's seeding into the entire garden and killing all of the aster twilight we planted. Uh, again, a really, really beautiful plant. <laughs> and um, really dumb mistake. You know, again, we're just playing with plants we're, we're not familiar with. We don't see a lot. And um, you can see up top here, we went and cut back the umbels so they didn't seed out a second year. And we had the most beautiful stand of Aster Twilight. If you don't know that Aster, it's kind of a newer introduction and a really nice late summer plant. Um, I really like, but um, almost the entire stand of Aster got wiped out because of this Arno Glossum. Um, so we're gonna move it to a dry and shadier site. Uh, hope, hopefully it'll tame it down with some other competitive plants around it. Uh, we do that with plants like Maclea cordata, which in sun can become like a 30 foot stand in about two years. If you put that in really dry shade, it's a perfectly well-behaved plant. So some of these really big plants that like sun, we just have to move them around a little bit. Um, here looking at mixes of Liatris and Asclepsia without lots of grass layers. That's where the Asclepsia wants to grow on the coast. This is up in Long Island, down below the Hamptons. And there's a lot of grass layers. It likes the sharply drained soil, but when you leave it kind of by itself, it looks really, really bad. Um, some other Menardas we like, Purple Rooster, um, not as dense um, of a flower or floriferous flower set, but I think it's even more delicate and really nice plant. It likes a little shade from the West here in the Mid-Atlantic. I don't know you all can't grow these well, but um, that's been a really nice selection for us to play with. Again, Sophium intermingled with Allium, and you can see this foliage now just flopping down and crushing all the Allium. So really uh, inappropriate planting composition, having these together, where you have this plant you might be excited about, but it's gonna outcompete the other without constant intervention. And we're a very small company. We have a very big garden here for how small of a company we are. And we just don't have help to, to go in and manage this. Um, we've been so lean. Our gardener for, the, for our garden has had to work in the field all year um, running a crew. We just don't, we don't have a lot of extra labor, which is really good for us because we're, we're learning so much of what we can and can't get away with. Scott Larry in Canada, this is the native skull cap. Uh, beautiful blue, clear blue flower in the spring. Um, butterflies love this plant. <clears throat> Lepidopter, you know, are really fond of this, but it just wants to seed into everything. And if it's out on an edge, um, this, the stems are kind of stark. Um, and so it doesn't really look good out on an edge at all. I love this plant, but it's running over geraniums and salvias and blephias I have in this garden. And so we're gonna to have to eradicate this all together and move it in with other competitive plants, which I think it'll be perfectly well suited to. But um, again, when you're trying to do this um, very intermingled plant community like we're playing with in the uh, central garden, just really ineffective. Uh, here it is again, Scutellaria in the foreground. And these are two Eupatoriums. Again, this is Dubium I mentioned before, the straight species. 
And this is um, phantom, which is, I, I believe is maculatum. This dubium had grown all the way over to the left here and closed off all of the depths of field uh, through to the Amsonias we have in the background and the millennias. Uh, so again, without intervention, this plant just really wants to be aggressive. Um, we're gonna move this into the wetland. We're gonna substitute it out for more of these, um, this selection, uh, Ubatorium uh, phantom, something that it hasn't moved all that rapidly. Uh, and again, the Ubatorium is really nice, um, but the straight species is just too competitive for this kind of planting. Um, here it is with uh, a new Calamagrostis, that Stonehouse Nursery, I believe uh, they're up in Michigan. Um, they've introduced, it's uh, called uh, uh, Jindai, um, real, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jinzhou. Um, and that's been a beautiful plant. Uh, last year, this was the autumn color on it, and I just didn't have a lot of space for it, so I kind of blew it, uh, planted it in a block. It really covered, colored up late, like November for us. So I thought that was really interesting. Although um, this year on the left, you can see it all flopped over. We had a really bad um, rainstorm and everything flopped. Um, it is getting a lot of shade um, from the west here. And so we're going to move this out. And so sometimes it's not just the plant, right? It's the cultural conditions of where you have that plant. And so we're going to move it to a sunnier location and see how that does next year. You know, I'm, I'm definitely interested in this plant. Um, I have not seen this planted anywhere. Um, maybe, maybe once at the Chicago Botanic Garden in their trial beds, but um, a really interesting new Calamagrostis. Um, I believe it's from Korea, um, although it's made, named after a Chinese province. Um, so I'm definitely interested in it, but we're just trying to figure out, you know, where is it most effective? And here on the right, uh, another great plant we were playing with, this was Nepeta Siberica, which I was so excited about, a very upright form of Nepeta. Um, I loved it, and so did the voles. They came in and just completely eradicated this in almost the entire crop in two big blocks I planted it in. So uh, maybe another reason not to do monocultures as much as I love them all the time, unless you really know. Um, you know, I think there are places for monoculture, but you really have to know what plants are going to um, be very stable. Uh, this was a very showy plant. And so um, I was talking to Dale about a, a lady in the industry named Bree Arthur. She came out and uh, stayed with us here and shared with me some arugula and mustard greens and um, poppy somniferum. And so we just seeded it into this area. Um, uh, a woman came in toward our garden and shared an Amsonia rigida. Um, which I'd never seen before. And so we grew those on as little one gallon pots and they're in there. It's gonna take some, them some time to move, um, but the blocks can definitely get hammered. This is straight species Amsonia Tabernay Montana with uh, Achillea um, Coronation Gold. And these look really great together early season. This is the autumn color coming on. And I was just really, crazy about the autumn color of this Amsonia. It had like a lot of roses and pinks that then faded out to red later in the season. Um, that's just a week ago, maybe, or two weeks ago. And I, I really liked that plant. I thought it was beautiful. Um, some panicum seedlings. This was north wind, which seeds out like crazy in our garden. Um, and the seedlings kind of do anything they want to. So instead of staying very fastidious, they kind of uh, move around when I was, um, lucky enough to visit you folks down in Memphis. I saw North Wind out in Liz's garden, and she shared with me that um, it wasn't really seeding out down there, which is really nice. Um, I don't think it gets as tall either. Um, here it'll get six to seven feet, but it wants to seed into everything. And so um, really difficult to use that plant in the garden. Um, some Calamagrosis with Agastache in the foreground. Again, a block planting with Agastache. We created this wet, uh, this space kind of overnight for a wedding venue. Uh, our superintendent wanted to get married in our woodland. And so we were just looking for whatever we had that was kind of cheap and available and put a lot of Agastache in to be showy. But again, it's kind of warm season and late to emerge. And so this is all weed pressure. We just cut this back the other day so I could share this photo with you folks. And the Agastache can be a really showy, quick plant. 
But if it's in a block, you'll get a lot of cool season pressure. And so a bulb layer can be very effective here or a layer of sedges or something like Cecilaria that can really outcompete um, these cool season layers. And then you would have to go in and space the uh, Agastache out a little bit. Here, here's all this chickweed that's developing. Uh, Budalua as a block, again, chickweed kind of consuming it. That's kind of in the back of our garden where it's not really getting much attention. And I know we're running out of time here, so I'll just rifle through a little bit of our woodland. Uh, Discomsia cespitosa, nice kind of low light uh, woodland grass. I don't love how it's put together here, but I think there's uh, definitely some use. We have uh, a still be purple candles behind it. And I think intermingling them might be really nice. Um, but again, the stilby was out on this outer edge and it got so dry um, this year, the stilby went dormant early. And so we had brown ivy kind of creep through that area. Um, and so we don't use mulches um, often, but here we're gonna do a leaf compost wood chip mi uh, mix with humic acid to try to really open up the soils and add some um, more carbon to the soil and just the biomass will help hold the moisture. So we're not really just trying to mulch from, you know, with these low grade mulches. I love the leaf compost and wood chip blend. We use it all the time and it's extremely effective for us. Um, and I'm convinced we're gonna get the soil to be able to hold more moisture. And this plant, if we go through a drought again, not to go dormant early in the season. And, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, again, looking at some different sedges, this is Leavenworth eye I'm really fond of. This center didn't really get planted, and so that's very weedy. But Tracky Stamen Orientalis, which is Oriental Borage, if you haven't worked with that plant, the, it has like a sapphire flower that comes out of the ground early in the spring. Very effective ground cover in dry, dry shade. Here it is in the back here. Uh, um, and the Carex uh, Leavenworth are really effective ground cover. You don't see any weeds coming through this. This is a big sedge called Carex divulsa, very effective ground cover. The inflorescence tends to get a little big and gangly. Uh, looks like an Andy Goldsworthy sculpture, sometime, sculpture uh, sometimes when it starts to lay down. But a really nice plant. It's written up for being in uh, wet um, and sunnier locations. I decided to move put it in dry shade under this pecan tree, and it does really well here. Um, one of our woodland salvias, this is salvia coemi, and um, I almost gave up on this plant after uh, two years, and then the third year put on a really nice flower. It's like a butter yellow, and I mixed it with um, chelone hot lips um, in a garden, and those colors were really nice together, that kind of saturated pink with the soft buttery yellow. Um, it does get a little beaten up from a um, uh, couple different uh, insects. We've seen uh, leaf hoppers on it, but it's still a really nice plant. I mean, there's not a lot of woodland salvias we've worked with, but I do like this plant. Um, here's Hellebore fetidus in the foreground, which we have a lot of problems with propagation. The nurseries rot them often before they can even get to us. Um, this was heavy, fine clay under this pecan tree. We couldn't go under there and mechanically improve the soil. Um, and this fetid has started rotting on us. We threw down about an inch of crushed stone and immediately the plant started standing up and blooming and seeding into the garden. So just that little bit of substrate on top of the soil, we, we weren't really cautious with it. We just threw down three eighths inch clean crushed stone as a quick mulch. Uh, it's a limestone and um, the plants did remarkably well. Uh, Carex texanensis, which I'm not fond of, but that was also rotting, um, but it stood right up, it greened up. So all we're doing is we're uh, reducing some surface tension right around the crowns of these plants. And they did extremely well. Carex appalachia was another one that wasn't doing well in this area. Um, still not a favorite, it's just too finicky, but it greened up right away, it stood up right away. Um, again, we're not mixing that in, we're just top dressing with aggregate. And that's all we're looking for. This again is Carex Alata in the back of our garden. So um, not very finicky, very clean. Uh, I love the silhouette of this plant, um, you know, very vasey. 
And that's what we're looking for generally when we're building gardens. You know, we want plants can, that can take a lot of neglect. We're trying to site them properly for the right cultural conditions of the site. And we're looking for compositions that um, are kind of equal in terms of how those plants will, um, you know, replicate themselves in the landscape. So one's not more competitive than the other. Um, and, and that's really it. Uh, some Carrick's albicans. Uh, this truly is a favorite of mine. Oak sedge, very clean. Uh, we don't get much seed off this plant, so more of a vegetative propagation. Um, and the nurseries are slow to propagate it because, of course, they love everything from seed. It's faster. Um, but this plant is really, really clean uh, in dry sh uh, shade. I mix it with some hoikra caramel here, which I don't usually mix work with that color often, but I thought it was nice. Um, yeah, I'm still a little on the fence about it, but I thought it was a really nice plant. So um, yeah, there's some of the compositions and um, um, a lot of our failures I got to, I got to uh, show you. Oops, that's, uh, that's it folks. Hope, hope we did okay. All right, you did great. Thank you, Donald. <laughs> we have some uh, comments and questions in the chat. Right. Uh, so the first comment was, um, I really like the stone sculpture shown in the early slides. Nice diversity of stone. Uh, what kind of uh, stone was used in those sculptures? If you know, oh, uh, that, that's uh, me ripping off Andy Goldsworthy. Really, that's a stone uh -huh. Karin, and um, I just wanted kind of a destination marker for the front of our studio. And that's what Karins really historically are, right? They're markers. Um, so I just gave our masons scale and I gave them a stone pile and we had sandstone and schist and even some antique brick pavers they added to that. Um, there's also a little bit of granite in there. So um, I didn't micromanage that too much. And uh, it's really a kind of cornucopia of stone, to be honest. Okay, um, question, how long have you been developing your garden? Um, I uh, bought this farm in 2008 and uh, um, it was several years before. I, I mean, we started working in 2008, but we, that was when the recession hit. I just bought a home. Uh, th this was literally all of my savings <laughs> <laughs> buying this property and uh, then trying to hold on to it, quite frankly. Um, so we started in 2008 doing whatever we could to find plants that would grow aggressively that we could just start making something of and learning. Um, now we have a little bit more budget um, as we've become a little more successful and I get to work with more and more plants that might not be as competitive or as thuggish, uh, which is really nice for us. You know, we can bring that then to our clients, you know, who want more delicate layers um, and that's, uh, I think they're very beautiful, but we had to make a lot, you know, I, I didn't have any formal education other than growing up in my mother's garden and working in that nursery. And uh, I didn't come from any means. Um, and so when people would give me garden projects, they would give me a little bit of money. And my goal was to spread that out as much as possible. And so we had to look for plants that were just move quickly. That was the, you know, if we could, uh, take a budget and make a thousand square feet as opposed to 250 square feet. That was my goal. Um, and so we learned by working with really competitive plants. And that's, that's how this garden got established as well. Okay, thank you. Um, do you ever grow any verbascums? Am I pronouncing that right? <laughs> yeah, so there's a picture of verbascum nigrum, which uh, Austin Eyeshield brought me from the Midwest. I'd ask him about that. He came to visit our garden and brought me some. Um, that's the only one we're really growing. It's a biannual. Uh, last year, it was exceptionally beautiful. Um, most of the, the second year of that plant is not so beautiful. Um, although we threw some aggregate down around it, we're hoping we get more seedlings next year. Um, and so we've just edited that out of the garden, but the bees love that plant. Um, I really love Nigram for sure. Okay, um, so, uh Comment, uh, North Wind in Memphis has seeded out along the Wolf River Greenway in Germantown where it was used in the road medium, median. Okay. Yeah, you're having the same issues we're having for sure. And, it, you know, it was selected because it had this really beautiful, fastidious form. Uh, 
it, it's blue and so it doesn't have the great autumn color that the green panicums will have. But, you know, it's a great lesson. I think we've oversimplified some of the issues we're having with this lesson of native plants. And that's a native plant, right? It's just a selection. Um, although you just can't put that in your garden and expect everything to be okay. You know, that's, uh, that puts a lot of pressure on a garden. Um, and so these, we're having very complex issues uh, in ecology. And, you know, I look at gardens as an opportunity to uh, kickstart, um, you know, some diversity in ecology. Um, but you, you know, you can't just say it's native, it's okay. Um, we'll be left with patches of Solidago canadensis and Panicum brigadum if we do that. And, um, you know, I'm definitely looking for diversity. And so um, as much as I love native plants, I'm, I'm always cautious about them. And uh, question is, what was the barrage for? Was it dry shade? I'm sorry, the- The uh, barrage? Borage, B-O-R-A-G. Oh, the borage. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, um, uh, that is dry shade for sure. I mean, it's dry as uh, you need it. We have a lot of pressure from Japanese stultgrass here. That plant is uh, one of the uh, several that we're working with that will run over still grass, which is great because that's a that's a really problematic weed here um, in the Mid Atlantic for sure. Mm, I just know it as a tea. <laughs> yes, right. You can make tea out of it. Okay, and uh, will Carex socialis socialis? I swear my Latin's usually better than that. Uh, will that work for us? Um, well, I've seen it in uh, in a garden there, so um, it does work. Uh, oddly enough, I don't see that on availability list down here, but um, I think I visited um, in July, if I'm not mistaken, and that plant looked really beautiful when I came to visit um, in, uh, in Memphis. So yeah, it's definitely um, uh, very accomplished gardeners are working with that already in Memphis, so yeah. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? I'd, I'd just like to make a comment. That was a great lecture, Donald. I, I, you did a great job with that. Interesting plants, as always. You're doing amazing, cutting edge stuff. And uh, we're just glad we could have you uh, talk to our group. And hopefully we'll get you to spend some more time down here in Memphis and, uh, and get to know some of the stuff that's going on here a little better. So thanks, Donald. Thank you, Dale. I appreciate it. I'd love to come down more. I love it there. All right. Thank you so much, Donald. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, there will be no Munch and Learn next week due to the Thanksgiving holiday. After that, we will return in person with Kevin Sharp, our own uh, director of the Dixon. If you aren't currently a Dixon member, we invite you to renew or join. We'd be grateful to add your name to the list of members who help make the Dixon a special place it is. Uh, we invite you to come in person to the Dixon to visit our gardens and to see Black artists in America from the Great Depression to civil rights and the Mallory Wurzberger exhibition by Philip R. Dotson. Thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. And again, thank you so much, Donald. Thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.